Hello everyone and welcome to this Bristol Digital Futures Institute lecture where we'll be hearing from Professor Daniel Nayland on his topic Do Pixels Have Feelings Too? and it will also be chaired by our co-director also Dimitra Simunidi. Uh, my name's Hayley, I'm the Institute and Partnerships Manager for BDFI and my role is to give you a big warm welcome and do all the housekeeping bits at the start so please bear with me. Um, we have two audiences today, some of you are um, here in person, thanks so much for making it out in the rain by the looks of it. Um, and thanks ever so much to all those who are joining online. So we're going to hear from our um, new academic co-director Daniel, who's going to speak for 40 minutes today and then we're going to have a Q&A after. For those online, you have the benefit of being able to ask questions throughout the event, so you can pop them in the Q&A function and we'll make sure to come to some of those when we do the Q&A at the end. And we'll try and do alternate between room and online so that everyone has an opportunity to ask questions. Um, and then at the end, for those who are here in person, you have the benefit of being able to join us for drinks and a food reception out back in the foyer at the end. Some of you have also elected to join on a tour at the end, so I think either myself or Jenny will be taking you around the building for a roughly a 20, 30 minute tour, just to talk about the facilities and what's gonna be happening in this building that you're sat in today. So I think I'll say no more than that, only to say how excited we are to have you all joining in person or virtually. Um, this is a real period of growth for the Institute. I think I have one slide that I'll pop up. Um, having started with a 29 million pound capital grant from Research England. We've developed £71 million worth of co-investment commitments from our massive partnership network of 28 partners and developed a really impressive research portfolio. We won't talk about any of that today, but we hope you see this event as an invitation to get in touch, to talk more and to find out ways to collaborate with us. And I'll say a few words at the end of the event on how you can best do that. So. Without further ado, I'm going to ask Dimitra, our chair for the session, to come and say a few words and introduce the session. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really delighted to be here to introduce our relatively new co academic co-director for BDFI, Daniel Nayland. And Daniel has a long history of socio-technical research and his particular interests are on issues of accountability, responsibility, and values in science, technology, and organizations. He has also worked on a very large number of topics and very diverse. I'm going to name a few. So he has worked on algorithms, security and surveillance, traffic management, airports and speeding drivers, waste biometrics, and malaria vaccines. So a very large, diverse number of topics, some of them, or all of them, are really related to technologies. So he's really interested in how we can use social science research to feed into design practices. And of course, with BDFI, we are feeding into the digital design practices. Uh, now a little bit about the talk, and I love the title, Do Pixels Have Feelings Too? So I'm looking forward to see if they have or they have not. Uh, but Daniel is going to assess the challenges of design more ethical digital, digital futures. And he's taking an example of neural networks for emotion recognition. And he explores actually during his talk what it would take to develop socio-technical methods to design ethics into these new technologies. So that's, that's very interesting because um, we need to incorporate ethics in, in our design thinking around new digital technologies. He will suggest, I hope, that we need to this kind of new methods uh, if we hope to achieve more inclusive, sustainable, and prosperous futures. So this is going to be a very good example how we can actually make a difference uh, with our BDFI design thinking. He's also going to extend a welcome invitation to explore collaborations with the BDFI in these topics, but also others. So. Daniel, we're really looking forward to your talk, so it's up to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Demetra. Thanks, Hayley. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming today. Welcome to the BDFI. Apologies for our noisy neighbours. If it gets really noisy and you can't hear me, do put your hand up. I can shout louder. I've uh, been lecturing for many, many years, so I can shout to the back of the room. So um, today, as Demetra mentioned, I'm talking about um, 
AI neural networks for emotion recognition. And I'm using that as an example of how we can try and design ethical principles into technologies at this kind of design and development stage. So why am I doing that? Well, you may have noticed yesterday on the news, Elon Musk and others talking about this need to kind of pause where we are with AI research, to go away and start thinking about how we deal with things like the social impact of AI, the types of things that we're asking AI to do, ethical issues involved in AI. So it's a kind of hot topic at the moment. Lots of people are looking at this, thinking about it, to some extent struggling with it. Although I am going to show today that there is a kind of history of thinking behind these issues. So it's not like we're doing this for the first time. It's not all new questions. Why am I doing this in the BDFI, though? Well, this is our mission statement, OK? So the BDFI recognizes that all new digital developments contain both technical and social issues and indeed that the two are kind of inseparable. So we call these socio-technical issues, right? If we're looking at the development of new technologies, there's often issues around things like transparency, accountability, impacts on privacy, surveillance, sustainability, trust, and so on, right? So what we're doing in the BDFI is trying to come up with methods and building on other people's methods for going out there into the world and capturing those socio-technical issues in some way but also looking at the methods that we can use to bring those back to the design stage of new technologies. It's not a straightforward challenge as I'll show today. Today I'm going to talk about ethical issues, but I'm going to use that term ethics quite broadly. Please do feel free to sort of enter into discussion at the end if you want to about that. I'm going to use the term ethics to kind of try and grasp quite a few different sorts of issues and bring them together in this particular technology that I'm looking at, artificial intelligence for emotion recognition. Okay. So, there is some background history to all of this work, and we can start that background more recently or going further back into history if we want to. I'm quite interested in things like the history of mathematics and how that underpins the development of algorithms and artificial intelligence, but there's no time for that today, really. But we could go back to the ninth century and do that if we wanted to. Ask me at the end if you want to talk more about that, because I'm interested in it. There's also quite a strong history, but a kind of stop-start history of social science engagement with artificial intelligence. I think that starts in about the 1980s, but perhaps it goes back further than that. So there's a kind of explosion that is in the 1980s, dies out a bit, reappears in the early 2000s, and then the last sort of 15 years or so, we get a kind of big explosion of social science interest in things like algorithms and AI. Some of that quite broad, looking at things like the power of algorithms, the social impact of algorithms, some of it more specific, looking at particular bits of technology, particular devices, and the kind of consequences of those and how we grasp those. Particular relevance today sort of feeding into the talk is some of the work that's been done in recent years on things like explainable AI. And I think Maricela's here today. Maricela's been doing some really interesting work with some of our BDFI partners around explainable AI. So you can go off and find out some more information on that. But there's lots of other work in that area as well that's appearing. I think Floridi's recent paper with colleagues is quite interesting on accountable AI because it kind of draws together and summarizes quite a lot of this literature. So it's kind of a good starting point for reading about this if you're interested in it. Okay, so the technology I'm going to talk about today is, is, is emotion recognition. This is a reasonably complex technology to get into. Neural networks and artificial intelligence work in particular ways, and there's lots of questions around things like how those technologies work autonomously, how machine learning operates, how those systems make decisions. Ethical issues in relation to that technology, as we'll see in today's talk, can be managed in various different sorts of ways. But I wanted to start with a slightly more straightforward example before we get into emotion recognition. So what is this? Right, now hold on to that thought. Okay, okay. <laughs> Did anyone say anything different from cat? I think I only, I only heard cat. Everyone said cat, right? Okay, good. So, cat. Now, we'll call him Dave for the purposes of this presentation today. So this is Dave. Okay, now... Cat, right, okay, so when I hold my phone over Dave, as I'm about to take a photo, the AI built into my phone places what's called a bounding box around Dave and then classifies Dave, right? It tells me the type of object that's in view. It does that in order to then kind of idealize the parameters set up on the camera in order to take a lovely picture of Dave, although this one's actually slightly blurry. Okay, so when I hold my camera over Dave, what happens? There's the bounding box and it classifies Dave, right? Okay, now, 
panda. Okay, so we could understand this as a kind of classic misclassification, right? The cat panda problem, we'll call it for today's talk. Why has it done that? Why has it come up with the idea of a panda? Well, this is partly to do with, I mean, we could say, you know, maybe my phone's not actually that much good, maybe I need a new phone. That's all reasonable, reasonable sort of argument, I think. But this kind of AI works in a particular sort of way, as we'll see today. And the classifications that it comes up with are based on features of the image that it draws out. Now, we could use Dave and the cat panda misclassification problem to start asking ethical questions, okay? So we could bring up some of these kind of, uh, I think, fairly broad ethical principles. And some of these are important. You know, so if we were gonna ask about confidence in the system itself, we might be slightly concerned here, right? We might say, hmm, don't know if we trust this particular form of AI to go out there in the world classifying things when it thinks Dave's a panda, okay? But then we would probably want to combine that question of confidence with some other ethical principles as well. Maybe context would be important here to understand where this technology is being used and consequence, what's this technology being used for? And in the case of Dave, the context is fairly neatly bound, right? Dave's lying down on the floor in my house, I'm taking a photo of him, and I guess that photo wouldn't really go much further. There's probably a bit of cloud-based analytics in my phone, but really no one's gonna care that much about Dave as a photo, right? It's not really kind of revealing too much about Dave. And if we wanted to understand something about consequences as well, not too much is gonna follow from this, except that I'm now using Dave in this talk. And getting consent from Dave is a little bit tricky. Anyway, okay, so if we wanted to look at those as kind of ethical questions, these would be the kind of so what ethical questions, right? What's the context, what's the consequence? And we'd wanna combine that perhaps with our question about confidence. Okay, so in a way there's not much going on here ethically, but that's quite useful for us, and we'll come back to that shortly. Let's get on to neural networks for emotion recognition. Now, the type of technology that I'm gonna look at today is based on what's called video analytics. This is a broad category of technology that uses neural networks to sift through streams of digital video data to pick out patterns within that data. So it's the same kind of technology that underpins the classification or misclassification of Dave, okay? Sifting through data to find a pattern and then drawing out some kind of result from that pattern. The type of neural network involved is called a convolutional neural network or CNN for short, and CNNs are often used in video-based data analysis because video, streams of video data can be quite data intensive. There's a lot of data there multiple frames per second, and if we expand that out to, for example, uh, a city center CCTV system or a train station with a CCTV system, we might be talking about 100 or 200 cameras, right? So it'd be, the system would have an input of huge amounts of data. CNNs are seen as particularly useful for analyzing this kind of data because they've got layers and nodes in them which break down the data into different components, okay? So there's a kind of disaggregation of data into lots of different small parts before it's re-aggregated into making a decision. So what would otherwise be a very data-intensive form of analysis is kind of broken down into lots of bits, which means that a reasonably large amount of data can be processed in a fairly short time. So how does that work with emotion recognition? The particular technology that we're looking at today comes from a project that I was invited to work on as the sort of ethical person, which is often a common role for social scientists in these projects. Just as an aside, I do get quite a few of these sorts of invites to be an ethical person on these projects, and I try and sort of avoid the ones where I'm just kind of sat there on an ethics board and I get bits of paper sent to me and asked to comment on them. The sorts of projects I like to get involved in are ones where I can kind of get involved more with the technology, with its design and development, doing research around that new technology and understanding the impact of it. This facial recognition system is no exception to that. So it involved me as the ethics person doing quite a lot of research with the designers and developers of this system and a whole range of other partners who were involved in the project. We'll talk about one or two of those as we go on. So the, the emotion recognition is based on faces and based on video analysis within this project, okay? So the CNN works firstly by looking for faces within the stream of video data, okay? It finds the faces, it places a bounding box around them like it did with Dave, and then it rotates those faces into an upright position. It divides those faces into a 50 by 50 pixel grid, 
This is my representation of a sort of 50 by 50 pixel grid. And then it produces what are called mini pixel grids, or there's other names for it as well, which are three by three pixels, okay? So it breaks down the image into these smaller components, and then it goes through, sifting through the image, looking for particular salient features of the face within that 50 by 50 grid. And then once it's done a whole line, it then goes down to the next line, right? So you get a huge number of grids overlapping each other. What the system is looking for is features of the face, eyebrows, eyes, nose, mouth, and then it gives those a numerical score to then give a probabilistic output on the emotion that's represented in this face, okay? So it might say this is 0.89 out of one happy. That's not a happiness scale, it's not like a league table which says this person's more happy than this. It's a probabilistic output. It's the system saying this is how confident the system is given the facial, facial features it's detected in what emotion this face is displaying, okay? Does that make sense so far? Okay, good. Shout out if I need to slow down a bit. How does that work? How does it come to make decisions? This is where we get to the machine learning, slightly autonomous aspect of artificial intelligence here. So the CNN kind of is doing machine learning. It's kind of being autonomous, but it's doing that within a framework that's set by the designers and developers of the system, right? You see various discussions, of course, about AI running out of control and taking over our lives. This is reasonably constrained. The system's not able to do that much here. However, it does involve a bit of machine learning. So how does it come to understand the face as representing a particular emotion? So the designers and developers of the system collect 6,258 publicly available facial images displaying particular emotions, okay? So the faces are classified by emotions. Any ambiguous faces are dropped at this stage. We'll come back to that in a moment. Oh, and there's about 300 different people involved that the faces are taken from. Half of these are fed into the system for sort of development and training purposes, okay? So about 3,000 images. The system is fed those images with the classifications attached to them. Happy, sad, angry, whatever. The system then does its thing with pixels, mini pixel grids, to build up what it understands as the ground truth for each of those emotional states, okay? So where are eyebrows, noses, mouths in position in relation to each other for each of those different emotions, okay? So it uses that and the kind of numerical uh, scoring of the mini pixel grids to establish what fear looks like on roughly around 800 faces and so on, okay? The designers and developers of the system then hold back the other 3,000 images and remove the classifications from them. They hold on to the classification so they can still see how those faces have been classified, but they don't give those to the system. So the other 3,000 odd images are used for testing. So the system is then given these images and has to try and match those faces to the ground truths that it's already built up, okay? So can it understand an unclassified face as being representative of fear? And in this system, it's 86.25% accurate in doing that, okay? 86.25% of the time, it's able to produce a reading of a face which matches what the designers and developers are expecting, okay? Does that make sense? So the system is making some machine learning moves, it's developing ground truths, it's slightly autonomous in doing that, it's slightly autonomous in making decisions about what a face represents. Are we happy with this? I think there's some ethical considerations that we can jump into at this stage, okay? So part of the problem that gets discussed in relation to AI is that often what we see is the output and we don't really get to see how that's come about, right? So being involved in these projects is quite useful for being kind of at this sort of uh, starting stage to sort of ask these quite basic questions of what's going on here. So we can build upon that first question that we asked about Dave, right? Where we asked about confidence, if you remember. So how confident are we in this system? 86.25% accuracy is what the designers and developers are claiming, but we might want to ask that very basic question, 86.25% of what, okay? Quite an important question to ask, because if we look at the faces, they're all somewhat like this. It's someone kind of looking directly at the camera, more or less, their facial features are relatively clear and on display. 
So we might understand that these facial images are somewhat idealized, at least in terms of what the system is expecting or what the system needs in order to classify things. We could also ask about emotional states. Perhaps some of you are already thinking this, right? Only seven, only seven. Where are the other ones, right? One thing I notice is not many positive emotions here. I think this is something about the state of the world in general, that we've got happiness. Most of the other ones are kind of negative, right? No excitement, that's not an emotion, as a, it's not a separate emotion here. Uh, no kind of desperately hanging on in the face of severe adversity or anything like that, or other, you know, emotions that you might want to identify. Okay, so only seven emotions, so we might want to ask about that, right? Are we reducing the world too much to a kind of simple kind of set of categories? Is there a bit more going on emotionally? There's also a problem of what's sometimes called in these projects overfitting, which effectively means that you are training the system to understand really well the training data that you've got, and is that a problem? So you might perhaps, you know, think as a kind of ethical challenge of creating all sorts of other tests for the system, right? Bringing in other sorts of data, bringing it into a setting like this, for example, where it's going to encounter multiple faces at the same time, or lots of different faces, or lots of faces that are not pointing directly at the camera, lots of faces that are moving at different angles. You might want to test it in all kinds of different scenarios in order to understand confidence. And as I said with the example of Dave, we'd probably want to understand that slightly more broadly in relation to things like context and consequence, but we'll come on to those in a minute. An interesting question to ask, though, is, is there an emotional truth here underlying this? Okay, quite a deep philosophical question, but this is part of the reason why I brought Dave into this talk earlier on. So, when we looked at a picture of Dave, I think most of us were relatively confident that the truth of the image was it's a cat, right? I think everyone said cat, everyone was thinking cat, fine. When we get onto emotions, is that kind of underlying reality as straightforwardly available? Is there an emotional truth that's just waiting there, sat, ready for us to collect? This is a big question because it relates to what it is that we're asking artificial intelligence systems to do. Right? If we're asking it to identify cat, I mean, okay, my phone thought it was a panda, but if we're asking it to identify a cat, that's somewhat different from asking it to identify an angry face or a sad face, perhaps. Okay, so rather than get too deeply philosophical about this, I've designed a quiz, are you better than an algorithm? Okay, so what I'm going to do is show you a series of faces, <laughs> I know, son, you knew this was coming, <laughs> I told you there was audience participation, I'm going to show you a series of faces from the database, and then I want you to tell me what the emotion is that's represented in those faces, okay? So just shout out. So this is the face that we've already seen, yeah? This is the one that we were using as our illustrative example. What kind of emotion is this face displaying? Stand up if you need to, have a look. What, fa what, what emotion is being displayed by this face? Come on, just shout out. Neutral, Neutral. anything else? Well, seven, I can, well, yeah, just from the seven, just from the seven. Why were you thinking something else? Confidence, yeah, yeah, because as you look at the faces, I start to find other emotions that are not in the seven, for sure. Yeah, so this is neutral. This is the kind of standard one that they use for kind of initial testing and developing development of the system. Let's look at a few others. What's, what's, what's going on here? I've put, I've put the... the things in. <laughs> Disgust. Yeah, we've got a few... Fear. So who said fear? So, so someone got it right. So it's possible to get it right, but it's possible to get it wrong quite easily as well, I would say. This one? I think this one's more easy. So, okay, so a few angles, more, probably more disgust. Yeah, that's disgust. Okay. And these are people actually pulling the face that they're asked to pull for the emotion, right? This one? Could be surprised, couldn't it? I think it's like frustration or something, but it's not on there, right? It's not allowed. You're not allowed to have that emotion. That's anger, yeah. What about this one? I could kind of recreate this one. <laughs> what's, the, what's the emotion being represented? Sadness? It kind of looks like sort of staring off into the distance. Contemplative, I would say, but that's, that's not allowed. Which one? Neutral. Neutral, yeah. Yeah, so there's a whole range of different ones, but like we don't agree, right? In, the sa in, in a different way than when we were looking at Dave. When we looked at Dave, we were like, yeah, cat, okay? So the question is, what is it that we're asking the AI to do? It's not a straightforward thing, perhaps, 
that we're asking the system to do, but I think there are kind of ethical consequences of doing this, right? We're asking the AI system to do something <clears throat> that perhaps we're not completely in agreement with the result. Like we don't find it completely easy to come up with a singular result. The underlying truth is somewhat cloudy. And that is kind of ethical, an ethical question because then if we get into things like consequences, using this system to make decisions about people, then we're into a slightly tricky area, aren't we? What we can see, though, in relation to the title of my talk is that emotions are certainly said to reside in the pixels, right? It's in the pixels that the system is going to go through and sift out particular arrangements of pixels as representing a particular kind of number, which is going to turn into a ground truth, which is then going to be used to compare other images and decide what emotions that face represents, okay? Now, Let's have a look at some use case scenarios. So I'm going to look at three use case scenarios so we can understand a bit more about context and consequence. The first two use cases are not from the particular project that I was working on, but I've kind of brought them in because this is where some of these technologies are used. The third use case is one from this project. The first use case, measuring audience responses, okay? So you can use this kind of emotion recognition technology to um, record video of something like this, and then understand how the audience is responding to a talk, a, a new advertising campaign, the end of a film, for example. I've put up this example here from, from this particular university where they're using this to test out attentiveness in a particular meeting, right? So there's some ethical questions here that we might want to ask, the same ones that we brought up in relation to Dave. Confidence. Now, if this technology proves to be able to represent with 86.25% accuracy emotion, the audience responses emotionally to a particular stimulus like an advert or a film, maybe that's kind of okay in that sort of setting. I mean, if we don't know too much about audience feeling up to that point, 86.25% might be okay. It might be okay. It depends kind of how precise we want it to be. The context is also relatively neatly bound, right? We'd probably want to stop at that point ethically and say, okay, so what can we design into the system in order to ensure that the data context is quite secure, right? So we might want to know about how's the data collected, how's it stored securely, does it move to any other environments? We might want to answer questions like that. But the consequences also are relatively limited, probably. Like if we're testing out a new advertising campaign, it's probably not too consequential for the individuals whose emotions are read, for example. So that might address some of our ethical concerns, but we'd want to add in another, at least another, probably lots of others as well, but at least one more ethical principle here, one of consent, right? So if we're doing this kind of emotion recognition, it's not too difficult to manage consent, right? You could imagine if I set it up today, so the system, I haven't, by the way, just in case you were thinking that I've done that sneakily, you know, if I'd set it up today to, to record your emotions, as you came in, you could be given a sort of data policy on how the data is going to be managed. You could sign up to take part in it, for example. Not too difficult to manage uh, consent. And consent could be reasonably full. You know, you could give quite a lot of information about it. So maybe the ethical challenges in this case are not too difficult. Let's look at a slightly more fraught ethical example. This comes from a project I was working on in airport security. It's used a, a, a CNN, again, to sift through streams of video data within a particular airport and um, understand, in this case, people's movement through the airport. So it didn't do emotion recognition, but it wouldn't be difficult to add emotion recognition into this system, okay, to try and sort of read people's faces as they went through, for example, security checks. So what might be the ethical issues here? Probably they're slightly more concerning than in that previous use case example. Confidence here is quite a big issue. 86.25% accuracy rate in an airport is going to create lots of problems. If you've got 20 million passengers or so moving through a busy terminal and um, say 14% of them, which would be uh, about 3 million or so passengers a year, are being misclassified, that's quite challenging. Right? What, what's going to happen to all those passengers that are uh, uh, misclassified in some way? Consequence here is also an interesting one, right? Why would you be trying to understand people's emotions as they move through an airport? This is part of what came up in yesterday's discussion where Elon Musk and others were talking about AI, where they were saying, you know, we're throwing technologies out there into the world without first thinking about what it is that we're expecting them to achieve, what we want them to do, and so on. 
So consequence here is quite a big question. Like maybe we could read people's facial emotions, but why? What would we do? Would we stop them getting on a flight, for example? So that would be kind of directly consequential for the people involved. Or more than that, would we put them on a list of people who's, you know, express their emotions in different ways? That doesn't happen at the moment, but there's certainly lots of technology around for airport security where you, you know, people do get put on lists. The interesting thing about context here, though, is that if you look at um, uh, research on passengers in airports, which I spent quite a lot of time doing, uh, passengers are very willing on many occasions to give things up in return for what they perceive to be security. So people may well consent to the use of this technology, particularly in UK airports. There seems to be a kind of higher tolerance of giving things up like privacy, data, and so on in return for what they think of as, as being secure. Consent in these sorts of systems is really, really interesting. It's very, very difficult to achieve in that full sense that we saw in the first use case scenario. This um, tying in with people like Helen Nissenbaum's work is more about notice than consent, right? You'd put up signs saying this system's in operation. You might even provide them with a website that they can go to, but it's not really getting people to sign up for something that says this is how the system's operating. Please, please sort of tick a box here or anything like that. We could stop if we were designing a facial recognition, uh, emotion recognition system within this sort of setting to try and think about some of these things as design features that we could build into the technology. Right? Is there an option for developing some kind of more advanced consent system, something like a smartphone app which gives people the options on how their data is managed, things like that. So there are kinds of design considerations that we could enter into. There's also those further ethical issues that we'd want to take into account. One of the big ones here would be compliance. Okay, so automated decision making based on video surveillance is illegal in many contexts. Okay, so we'd want to get quite a lot of uh, legal input into this, legal advice on this, on how this could be made legal. It's probably illegal without a human somewhere involved in the decision making process. Let's look at a third use case scenario. This is the scenario that the, that the technology was designed to be used in, or at least one of the scenarios. This is a therapeutic setting um, so there's a hospital were one of the partners involved in this project. So they were interested in the possibility of using this technology in a therapeutic s setting where young children who had, had, who had um, trouble expressing their emotions in conventional ways um, might be assisted by this emotion recognition system. So some of these children had experienced different kinds of trauma. Some of those traumas had involved adults, for example. Of course, all of the medical professionals in these settings were adults, and so there was a concern that the medical professionals weren't quite getting as much information as they could from the children about how they formed their emotions, about how their emotions were operating, what they were feeling at any particular time. So the suggestion was maybe this emotion recognition system could be built into a child's toy, that in a play situation, the children might feel more open to express their emotions more freely, that the system could do this work of reading the faces of children and then producing outputs about the emotional state of those children. And that this might feed into the medical professional's knowledge of how the children were and how they were feeling. It wasn't about to kind of resolve all the children's problems, of course, but it might contribute to some sort of positive benefit for the children. Okay, so what do we think here? Confidence. If we could manage to get up to 86.25% accuracy here, is that good enough in this setting? It might be okay. If we're in a setting where perhaps the medical professionals are struggling to understand the emotional responses of children, perhaps having some data is better than others. The difficulty is how you'd ever know the accuracy rating of the system is a fairly mysterious thing because you don't actually have access to things like the classification of people's emotions that they use to train the system in the first place. So confidence here is almost impossible to set. So that's quite a big ethical concern, particularly if the system itself has consequences, like you're making decisions about the children, at least maybe partly based on this and a range of other information. The context is interesting because obviously it's a medical setting, so it's reasonably bound, right? It's reasonably contained. You could put in all sorts of things about how you'd manage the data. You'd probably put in you know, managing the data within context data analysis on site rather than using cloud-based analysis, ensuring that data doesn't go anywhere else, ensuring, what are you trying to say, five minutes, okay. Ensuring that the data doesn't transfer to anyone else, that perhaps only the medical professionals have access to the data. So you could try and design all of that into the way this is used in the setting. 
And it would be up to the medical professionals, I think, to really kind of define up front what the consequences of this would be, how they would go about using the data, but you'd have to then get that very carefully built into the system. Consent is difficult with children under 10, but you'd probably have to involve parents and guardians in this and get them sort of signing up to things like the data management process that's involved. Compliance, of course, would be a concern again because medical settings have their own kinds of legal requirements, so you'd want to build that in. Also, though, as a researcher at this point, I feel like it's appropriate to do quite a lot of consultation on this, right? So I want to go out and talk to patient representatives. I want to go out and talk to parents whose children are in this setting. I want to talk to the medical professionals within this setting, and I want to understand a bit more about all the different concerns that they have and then see if there are ways to design responses to those concerns into the system. So what do you think? Is this an ethical use of the technology? Are we happy for this technology to be used in this setting? Hands up for yes, hands up for yes. Oh, it's really tall. Oh, kind of half a hand, one at the back, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, not many of you. I think are, are quite a few people worried about the use of this technology in the setting? Slight concern. So I have concerns about the use of this technology in this setting. I don't think it's ready yet to just be introduced into this setting. I think that there's potential risks to the children involved that they're very vulnerable. So part of these kind of ethical assessments of technology is, I think, really important. It's the opportunity to say no, or at least pause, the development of the technology while we do further research. So that's what I called for in this particular case. The, med the, the, um, the, the computer uh, designers, developers, programmers of the system decided to go ahead and test this on some of their own children just to see what it would happen. I'm not allowed to stop that from happening. They do that in the privacy of their own home. That's their choice. What they found was that children picked up the toy by its leg, swung it round, that they would get some kind of blurred picture of someone's ear or something like that, right? Emotion recognition was very, very difficult. So I put a pause on this project while we did further research. There's some more detail to it there. But as we're coming up to the final five minutes, I better, better get a move on. So hopefully you've got a picture. There are different use case scenarios, raise different kinds of ethical concerns, but also different, demand uh, different design concerns as well, right? We've got to understand how the technology is going to be used, what use it's going to be put to in order to design responses to the ethical concerns that might arise in those situations. Airports are different from a lecture theatre, in my view. Some ongoing thoughts. So I don't like to give presentations as if I know all the answers. I don't. So these are some things I'm thinking about at the moment. I'll come on to some firmer conclusions in a moment. I'm quite interested in this question of confidence. I think we can approach confidence in at least two different ways. You can think about confidence in relation to those kind of controlled tests where we get accuracy rates, where we get the system deciding on its probabilistic outputs, for example, how confident it is that it's, it's recognized a particular emotion. But we can also think about confidence more broadly in relation to things like trust. So I've been going through some of the history of social science research on trust to try and pick out ideas that I think might be useful for thinking about things like artificial intelligence. Bernard Barber's work is really, really interesting here. He identifies two different models of trust. One is a kind of competence model. So do we trust the system's competence to do what it's supposed to do? And I think really that's how I've been talking about conf com confidence quite a lot in this talk today. Do we trust the system being competent to do what it's supposed to do? Barbara's second version of trust is really, really interesting. I haven't managed to think through the consequences of this. Barbara's second version of trust is, do we trust that the system will put our interests ahead of those running the system? And I don't know quite how we work through that in relation to AI, but that's quite interesting. Do we trust the system to place our interests ahead of those operating the system? Hmm. Big challenge. There's various other versions of trust as well. Shapin's work on the history of science is really interesting here because Shapin looked at how early science involves lots of demonstrations to build trust in the types of scientific discoveries that people were making. And I think there's a kind of element of AI which is similar to that too. I'm also interested in truth, which we don't really have time to talk about fully today, but that question of truth as an underlying reality is fundamental to the development, design and development of AI systems, right? When we look at the example of Dave, we're perhaps quite confident that there's a kind of underlying truth there of, his, of him being a cat. Emotions may be not so much the case. So it raises a question of what it is that we're asking AI systems to do. It also raises quite important question of who or what, in the case of AI, declares what the truth of a particular situation is and how do we deal with that ethically. 
We've also got truth as input and output, and I haven't quite figured out what the consequences are of that yet, but that's quite interesting too, right? So truths, ground truths are a way of kind of shaping the data that comes into the system, but the system's results offer us a different kind of truth too. Let's have a look at some other sorts of ways of thinking through some of these issues. Just in general, I would suggest that these developments are, as I said at the start, never purely social or technical. There's a kind of strong socio-technical component to these. The way I go about trying to do this research is to not focus narrowly on the technology, but to look at things like the software, the hardware, the people, the processes, the resources, the relations involved. So quite a broad assembly of different sorts of things involved in order to try and understand ethical issues that might arise, but also how we can engage in different areas in different parts of the system to try and make changes, to try and think of design and development quite broadly. Design and development in these computational projects is often about stripping away uncertainties. So things like emotion moves from something really uncertain to seven emotional states with specific ground truths attached to them. Ethics is often about adding uncertainties back in, right? So there's a kind of tension there. I think that's a really useful tension. I think that's a really useful tension. I'm very, very happy to work with computer scientists the whole time saying, oh yeah, but what is this? What about this? What about this? And as long as everyone else is happy with that, I think that's a really good way to proceed, right? So you've got this kind of tension between certainty and uncertainty. We haven't talked about this at all today, but in various different projects like this, when the technology doesn't work very well, there's often discussion of changing some aspects of the world around the system in order to get the system to work better. You see this in airports quite a lot, for example, what would the ideal airport terminal look like in order to enable this kind of system to work? It's a question that we came up against in the airport project. Experiments here are really important for kind of testing things out and not kind of leaping too far too early. And I think that kind of fits in with some of yesterday's discussion that Elon Musk and others were having about this. You know, let's slow things down a bit. Let's ask these questions. Let's do some kind of experimental work, see what happens. History has a part to play here, and we didn't get time to talk about that today. Things can always be otherwise, right? So you can get to some point in this project where things just seem to get stuck the way they are, but I try and hold on to this because there's always some change that you can make somewhere in some part of the system. There's always some other way of trying to do things. And then it's quite important ethically, I think, to try and hold on to this opportunity to say no or at least to put a pause on things. These are the ethical principles that we looked at today. Of course, there's other ways that we could do this. And in other types of technology, even in other types of AI, there might be other ethical principles that we'd like to bring in. But I think these work reasonably well. There was one that I didn't have time to shoehorn into today's talk, <laughs> which is quite a long-standing one about creep, or what, might, what used to be called function creep. The idea that if you develop this sort of technology, that it can then be taken up and used in other areas. It's very difficult to control that. So for example, in use case one, if we're happy with it being used in a lecture theatre and we say, yeah, 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 let's develop that. It's really hard to stop that from then shifting to use case scenario two or three because once the technology is out in the world, you know, we can't really then stop it from being used in those different ways. So it's quite difficult to think through all of those things, but having this opportunity to say no, having an opportunity to put the brakes on things, having an opportunity to do a sort of pause and rethink, I think is really important for trying to address those issues. And I shall stop there. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Such an interesting position to be the ethical person in the project. <laughs> Thank you. Let's start with the Q&A. Uh, I'm sure we are going to have a lot of uh, questions uh, from the floor. Thanks so much for this, Dan. It was very, very enjoyable, very thought-provoking. And I have to say that Mission Creep was on my question list. So I'm not going to ask about that because you already addressed that. But one of the things that I was reflecting on was the context as well. So I was, while you were talking, I was thinking Finland, right? Because um, there is that joke that, how, how do you recognize it? Is there anyone from Finland here, by the way? No, okay. So there is this, there is this um, joke that goes around. So, so how do you recognize an introvert from Finland? Well, he's looking into his own feet as opposed to other person's feet. So, so people from Finland do not apparently express emotions in a certain way that people from the West could relate to. So my question is, when training these systems, again, are we focusing on something that is Anglo-centric, that doesn't have cultural references, that doesn't have 
um, embedded issues around race, gender, etc. So just a few comments on that, if yeah, you can, please. Yeah, yeah, no. So um, I mentioned in the 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 final slide there about the stripping away of uncertainties. I mean, this is exactly what happens, right? You strip away all of the kind of messiness, and you just like focus on things like these data. Oh, yeah, sorry, this kind of archive of fairly idealized facial images on the terms of the system. So there's all sorts of situations where this kind of stuff wouldn't work. It doesn't really work with the children at all in the, in the, in the setting. That people not looking at the stuff, not looking at the camera, for example, are a big problem. When I did that project on um, airports, what you notice is that, you know, there's airports are hugely messy and busy with all kinds of people going, walking across each other and huge crowds of people and other times it's empty. So that creates all kinds of problems for the system. So they try and figure out ways to, uh, to strip away those uncertainties. There are various developments within these technologies that try and address concerns around things like race. So, I, I mean, you're probably familiar with this literature as well, sorry, but if you go back to the kind of early stages of this literature, there was lots of concerns raised about things like skin color and the probability of the system being able to, for example, detect your face. It wasn't even about emotion recognition at that point, but detect your face at that point. And many of the problems there were related to things like high contrast skin colors. So the, depending on what's behind you when you're being filmed, it could be if it's being filmed from above, it could be the floor, or if you're being filmed at a lower angle, the wall. If your face is similar color to the wall or the floor, you're less likely to be picked out. And this is either problematic or not problematic, depending on which way you look at it. So it's not a direct racial bias in relation to a particular skin color, but it's the contrast between the background. Various developments have been made to try and address these sorts of things by training the system to understand what different backgrounds are, different lighting conditions are, how shadow works and stuff like that. This is still fairly experimental though. So I mean I think lots of those potential biases are still there. Um, and many of those attempts to understand particular floor coverings or wall coverings or lighting conditions would still need to be tested out in that way that I mentioned sort of earlier on in the talk, right? You'd need to try lots of different, you know, what you might call kind of real world beyond the, beyond the experimental sort of lab scenarios where you could try and test that out. Um, so effort, so there's some sort of recognition of racial bias and things like that, but yeah, still to be completely convinced that that would work in the real world. Thank you. Next question, please. Um, thank you, I really enjoyed that. Um, my question is, um, is it true that the things that are more fun to work on for you are things that are kind of a more more questionable to begin with? And uh, I'm a data scientist, and I, I work in data science and AI, and I'm interested in how it can be ethical. Yeah. Um, and relatedly, um, how like what's a good way of engaging sociologists? Um, if you want to do that as a, as a technical person. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so there's a couple of things there. So in terms of what projects are most interesting for me, I mean, the projects that are most interesting are ones where I get to play some kind of meaningful part in it. I don't really like to just, you know, get sent some stuff by email and then just comment on whether, whether or not it's ethical. I think this is partly because this sort of run of projects started with quite detailed engagement with the technology where I became very worried about the ability of that technology to do what people were claiming it would do. So I am genuine, genuinely interested in that and what the technologies claim to do. There are, of course, more and less contentious versions of these technologies in use. So um, among, the the, among the projects sorry, that I've done, they've included things like... Um, an AI video analytics system that helped um, guide people through museum space, for example. Not particularly contentious, but still really, really interesting to understand the relationship between the people, the space, the information, the objects on display and so on. Um, so it's not just about trying to find contentious cases. Um, with emotion recognition, I think it's quite difficult to find a use that's not contentious. I mean, I used the sort of lecture one as the least contentious that I could find. Maybe there's another one somewhere. Um, people feel quite personal about emotions, right? And that's probably because it's kind of deeply sort of tied to, you know, feelings and um, generally that kind of sense of negative feelings that when we think about emotions, we probably think not, not so frequently about happiness or joy or excitement, but about 
anger or fear or sadness. And then, so that, you know, there is a lot of contention. In terms of the best ways to work with social scientists, so I get these invitations and then enter into discussions with, normally these are kind of consortium projects. Um, you know, so I think most social scientists who, who work in this field, and I, those, there was an early slide where I put up quite a lot of that work, um, there are quite a large number of social scientists that do enjoy working in these fields, and then there's quite a few that don't. So there's sociologists that are reluctant to take part in these projects because they feel they would then be compromised in some way. My feeling has always been it's actually much more interesting to be on the inside of these projects, working with industry, working with computer scientists, trying to figure out, well, how can we do that? How could we improve things? How could we make a change? And um, I think that's the case for many sociologists. So, I mean, you know, you can <laughs> engage with any of the social scientists at the BDFI and um, you'll get a very friendly response, I'm sure. Can I follow up this question? Sorry, I shouldn't probably, but I'm, I'm really bursting to ask this. Uh, so you, you did emotion recognition mm -hmm. detection through cameras. Yeah. Uh, yes, and actually doing some signal processing and neural networks there. Quite a lot of people, I mean, uh, it's common in the field to start doing emotion recognition through biometrics. Yeah. How would you feel about this? because it doesn't actually involve any face recognition. So it could be, if you like, depersonalized, mm -hmm. but still, if you are looking at biometrics, it could actually give levels of anxiety, levels of happiness yeah. through inference. Would that change your position in terms of ethics? Um, I think there'd be some different, dif different ethical questions raised there. So we'd still want to look at some things like data management and how the technology works. We'd still want to ask some of the same questions around confidence and context and consequence and those sorts of things. Um, but the answers would probably play out differently for sure. I mean, I wouldn't want to kind of jump forward and just say, yes, that's ethically okay until I saw the particular way in which it was being used. There's a whole range of different ways in which emotion recognition is done now. There's this stuff um, that's done now on I'm probably going to mispronounce it. Is it digital phenotyping where they use mobile phone data to try and understand people's emotions? I mean, that's really, really interesting as well, right? But there's probably sorts of ethical questions there. You'd have to, at least initially, get people to sign up to, you know, allow access to their data and those sorts of things. So probably different ethical questions there. Uh, and I would, you know, hold on to some scepticism about there might be some important ethical issues there. Uh, but I don't think it's impossible to design systems that take into account ethics. Mm. Yeah. No, thank you. And uh, having abused my chair, <laughs> maybe <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's quick go to the next. Um, really, really interesting talk. Um, I've, got, well, I've got a question and a, and a small request. Um, the question kind of responds or comes out of the really helpful list that you provided of the things that you're thinking about in relation to the three projects. And mm. I suppose I was just curious about your thoughts around the explainability of what's going on. You know, no. could, like, where, where are the justifiable trade-offs in terms of something that might, we might have more confidence in or might be more accurate versus the extent to which we can actually explain as the people who are building these systems or even the people who are subject to those systems what's actually going on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I mentioned earlier on that Maricela and, and partners have been doing this work on explainable AI. In relation to this kind of AI, it's quite interesting to think about explainability, isn't it? Because you're sort of somewhat distant from the system, depending on the context, right? So you can, in the sort of lecture scenario, probably make it explainable in a very different way than in the airport scenario, for example, where you're probably always in a hurry to get somewhere and uh, there's probably always cameras about and you're probably not really thinking, oh, I wonder if that camera's connected to an emotion recognition system. That doesn't mean that it's right. And it will be interesting to sort of look at how we could set up relationships in spaces like that, like airports or train stations, which would allow us to engage people in a discussion of those sorts of technologies or at least an understanding of what those technologies are. So when we look at things like um, smart spaces and moving towards having kind of connected spaces and having lots of digital stuff going on in something like a train station or airport, we should sort of fold that into the mix, I think. How do we get this across? How do we communicate what's going on with all of these things and people's data, how that data is being used and what it's for through those sorts of channels? One more question. We, can, we have 
Uh, hi. hi, thanks very much for the talk. Uh, can I ask you, what do you make of uh, testing as a kind of mode of rolling out AI in the world? You know, the fact that anyone on the internet can test ChatGPT, that there are drivers in the UK that drive autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. And I guess given like iterative nature of software or kind of, you know, collaborative, is there any point going feature that there is something that it's after testing? What, what's, the, what's the next step? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's different phases of testing, of course, right? So um, there's, you know, very, very initial testing, which um, is looking at, for in this case, you know, uh, uh, using images that are, you know, I don't know, not maybe hugely representative of the world beyond the system, but that's a kind of an initial set of tests. Then you would move into that kind of more real world set of scenarios, where, and then you'd sort of build up from there. Uh, I imagine that as these technologies would be rolled out, so I mean, we don't really have um, uh, autonomous vehicles on a huge scale used in, you know, everyday life in this country at the moment. But if we get towards that, we'd be, you know, you would want to hang on to the opportunity to use the data that that produces to then kind of, you know, improve and further develop the system, right? So is there a stage beyond testing? You might call it something else because testing might sound like the sort of stuff you do at the preliminary stage, but the general imperative to find more data and to kind of use that and try and figure out ways to improve the system, I think would be important. What we don't have complete understanding of at the moment is all of the methods that are best for doing that and for translating that data into things like design principles, which we can then use to improve the technology. There's obviously examples of that, and there's kind of, you know, I can come up with lists of stuff that people should take into account, but I, you know, we're still some way from saying, well, that's the complete picture for what we need for all of these different systems. So there's, there's, there's quite a strong research imperative there, even if I am just promoting our activities here, but there is quite a strong research imperative there to just say, well, okay, so what, sorts of data do we need to collect? What are the methods that we need to then translate that data into something meaningful in terms of the design and development of the system? Right, one more question, and that would be the yeah. last one. Yeah, I was just interested in, um, in that, uh, that your, your last slide where you say you, we, could, we have to retain that ability to say no. And obviously, the case you, you gave us, that they listened to you, and that was mm -hmm. great. But you can imagine in many cases, yeah. um, you know, the, the, the imperative to get to market, to start making money, to see the thing to fruition will be too strong. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose my question, um, I, so I'm a lawyer, um, you, you referred to the compliance section, but it's, yeah. I think the law around this is a much sort of a wraparound in effect yeah. is what we're looking for. Whether you think the law as it stands is adequate, whether it needs to address some of these things and perhaps you might suggest how it could be. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you go back to the sort of start of the development of things like data protection law, which was very heavily shaped by UK lawyers in the first place, some of those principles are really, really interesting still to use. Things around proportionality and necessity and all of those sorts of things. And then, of course, you get things like the, the move towards the general data protection regulation, which is a huge shift in terms of the... Um, the policy, the, 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 sorry, the legal mechanism that's in play there, right? You go from a directive, which is a set of principles that people can interpret and apply to a regulation, which is here's a single set of rules that everyone has to follow across the EU, right? And at the moment, we still have that translated into UK law, but there's various discussions around changing it and, and bringing in for things. There's also these discussions going on around uh, uh, yeah, the regulation of AI and accountability and so on and what that will look like. So it's quite a lively set of discussions at the moment. We, I don't think we do have a perfect setup for this at the moment. Um, the general data protection regulation, so I worked with some of the authors of the um, GDPR, which they started doing back in whatever year it was, 2012 or 13-ish, and then it kind of eventually came into into force in, uh, was it 2018, I think, so it took about five or six years to get everyone together to get the policy in place. What was interesting about that was to make it a regulation, to make it a standardized policy across Europe, it required a market enabling component to it because that's what regulations are. They have to be market enabling at the EU level. Directives are different. They can be sets of principles. So to become a regulation, you have to show that you're enabling the market. 
What that meant was that the GDPR got compromised in all kinds of different ways, according to the authors of it, right? It becomes kind of partly about stopping the market, but partly about enabling the market at the same time. Hmm. So a very imperfect policy mechanism, if you, if you ask me, and I've written about this in various places. You can, I can send you the, the, the papers that I've written on this if you want. Um, What's the prospect going forward? Well, these new legislative discussions that are going on at the moment around AI more specifically and around accountability, we should be interesting for seeing how those go. Um, there's quite a lot of consultation on that at the moment, so I'm trying to kind of, who knows if anyone will listen, but trying to kind of input my views into that as well, and I think everyone else has got the chance to do that too. Um, be interesting to see where that ends up. I'm perhaps less of a compromise than the GDPR. Yeah, that might be, that might be my answer for the moment. Thank you, Daniel, and that concludes this very interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you both to Demetra and Daniel. I promised that I would say just a very few um, words about if you've been inspired to get in touch today and if this is an area that you're interested in, there's lots of ways that you can get involved. You can come and talk to any of us if you're in person during the networking event afterwards. If you're online, please do um, get in touch. You can use bdfi-inquiries at bristol.ac.uk to get in touch. There are other talks coming up. Um, Devika is next with a, an approach to industrial change in this, in this digital age. We've got seed corn funding available to pump prime new, exciting cross-disciplinary multi-sector projects. So do check out the website if you're interested in applying for that. And shortly we'll be launching neutral lab residencies. There'll be lots of opportunities to, to um, take on reality emulator projects that will partly be based in this space. And if you're joining the tour, we can talk a bit about that. Um, but otherwise, I think you're probably all desperate to um, either get off online or come and network and keep the conversation going. So I'll stop there and just say thank you again to our chair and speaker and to everyone here. <laughs>